So uh, Sarah and I met through uh, going to the same church. And one February, a group of friends decided it'd be great to go skiing together. Let's arrange a skiing holiday, skiing trip. Um, so what we did, we, um, we hired a minibus and we took the 12-hour drive. We took it in turns to share the driving. 12-hour journey up from Cambridge, where we lived, up to, up to Edinburgh. Now, look, Scotland. It's quite different than the sort of mid-Europe. You know, you go skiing in Europe, sort of middle of the season, you've got fairly consistent weather conditions. You know what you're getting. But Britain is very different, isn't it? Very different. So on the first day, we're out on the slopes, and they're just wasn't enough snow, you know, to cover all the rocks. And we thought, this is not going to be a great experience. So we drove about an hour north to find some more slopes. And after enjoying some more of the white stuff for a little while, and things were going well, suddenly the weather changed. A blizzard sort of blew up from nowhere. And it was really problematic because we were struggling to see very much in front of us, and we were quite scared about what might happen. And after a little while, when we realized that the weather wasn't going to hold up, we were worried about injury or losing each other, we managed to, all all the group managed to find each other and clamber back to what we thought was the safety of the minibus. But that wasn't the end of the story, because the weather was getting so bad that actually the roads were becoming really icy. And so the minibus, it was my turn to drive at this point, lucky me, and uh, the roads were getting so icy that it was the, the, the tyres on the minibus were finding it hard to grip the road. So we're going really, really slowly at times, just going in first gear. You imagine like little mountainous roads around uh, Scotland, and it was really treacherous. So going really, really slowly, worried not to slip and hurtle down the side of a mountain. But even still, when we came to a very slight incline because of the slipperiness of the road. We were struggling to grip. So a couple of people, these are not real photos of the story, right? This is just things that I found. We didn't have time to take photos. We weren't thinking of that at the time, yeah? Um, but, but there were one or two people that were getting out of the minibus just to try and help it push up the slope just so we could get on level ground again. And we did so. We carried on. We even actually came across someone else who had broken down on the side of the road. The car was broken down. There was no mobile signal, and they jumped in with us as well. And we carried on very, very slowly until we hit a point in the road where the gate was shut. The road was closed. Sometimes in Scotland, you get snow gates that literally shut the road off. There's nowhere to go. But what happens then to the people that are already on the roads? with no mobile signal, and with a vehicle not capable of coping with the conditions. The problem was we were stuck, and we were helpless. We realized by now that there was no way out. And you've heard stories, haven't you? You switch on the news and you hear stories sometimes of people that haven't survived the conditions. We were helpless, and we realized that that we had no hope unless there was some outside intervention in our situation leave a cliffhanger for you there, but uh, last week, the first part of our story in Jonah ended with Jonah in an even more helpless and hopeless situation. Do you remember the beginning of the story? The Israelite prophet Jonah was given a mission by God to go to Nineveh and preach against their wickedness, but he couldn't stand the possibility that God might even show mercy on some, uh, towards some of these enemy Assyrians and spare their lives. So what did he do? He ran. He ran in the opposite direction. No, not going. These people don't deserve it. So what did he do? He paid for a boat trip to far, far away, Tarshish, um, even though he knew full well This psalm, he knew full well that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He knew that God is the almighty, sovereign God. No one can run from him, and yet he still tried doing it. We noted last week how we do the same, don't we, in our lives sometimes. We try and get away from the God who's everywhere. We're very inconsistent. But the impossibility of escaping God's reach um, is either a very scary or a completely comforting truth, depending on which side of the fence you're on 
Um, many, many Christians over the years have been so helped and encouraged by some of the words from Psalm 139. I bet some of you can even quote some of the words now. But just listen to, listen to some of David's psalm, and it tells you about God's presence being with us. David prayed, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now the totally worrying thing for those who are defying God and whose hearts are so hard that they'll never repent is that our sins will find us out and we will be judged. But for those who belong to the Lord, our assurance is that God does not give up on us. God never loses us. God never lets us go. Yes, we might need to repent, but there is always hope. And where is our hope? Well, multiple times already this morning we've been reminded of where our hope is found, which is in God himself, in his son Jesus Christ who came to earth, who paid the price for our sin. That every sin is covered. When we come to the cross, we know that there is nothing that God will not forgive us for. And that God's purpose is to forgive to purify us, to to help us to grow into the likeness of his son. That's what's happening in the story of Jonah, that God doesn't give up on Jonah, he doesn't give up on us, but he's working in our lives all the time to bring us back and to work for good. And what did God do in Jonah's case as Jonah was running? How did God catch his attention? How did God show him that he didn't want his life in sin to go smoothly? He sent a storm. He sent a storm to stop Jonah from going too far in his sin, to wake him up, and he was thrown overboard into the depths of the sea. But what we see in our story today is we see what God was doing to bring transformation in Jonah's life. And there's three big things we're going to pick out today to show us what God was up to for him and what God is up to for us. And to just emphasize again that God is the hero of every story um, in the Bible and in our lives as well. And here's a really, really important place to start from from chapter 1, verse 17, which is this. God provides the means to turn our lives around. See the words of verse 17? It says this, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You notice what it doesn't say there. What it doesn't say is that God punished Jonah beyond possible restoration. It doesn't say that, does it? It says God provided for Jonah. God provided. What did God provide? God provided the fish which kept Jonah in its stomach for enough time to bring about the change that God wanted for Jonah. So this is a provision story. It's not a punishment story. Can you see the difference? I hope you can. And hope you can see the difference in our lives, in what God is doing. Um, God is known in Scripture as Yahweh or Jehovah Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide. Do you remember how God provides? That God provided for Abraham in the ram that was to be the sacrifice in the place of his son Isaac. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. And God has provided for us through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, so that we won't be punished, but but God took that for us through his son. Most famous verse in the whole of Scripture says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that so whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Can you see? God provides. He provided his son. So God, in his love, gives He provides. He gives because love gives. Love gives out. 
And that's who God is. And so we see here that as God is the pro provider, God was providing for Jonah for a good purpose. There's a very popular song called Jaira. I don't know if you know it or have heard it going around at the moment. And some of the words actually are sort of hit home with this story of Jonah. Some of the words say this, Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. You would cross, cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. You are Jaira. You are enough. It's true. Now last week, we established that this story of Jonah was written as a true account of things that really happened. Indeed, Jesus linked the story of Jonah to his own death and resurrection, didn't he? He's equating the two and saying, that was real, and so what I'm going to do is real, physical. It's a real historical thing. And um, many, therefore, many people have speculated as to what type of fish or sea creature this might have been that swallowed Jonah. What, what, what creature has the capability, the capacity to have had him in his belly for three days. There's part, a part of us, because it's a true story, we want to understand it, don't we? We want to get to grips with the credibility of the account. Um, in the wake of the, uh, the, the Titan submersible disaster recently, uh, it's created obviously natural, huge interest, isn't it, into its inability to keep people safe at the bottom of the ocean. And so therefore, we also, when we think about, we come to this story, we, we want to know the capability of this fish to, to be able to keep this man safe from harm uh, under God's command. There's been quite a lot written about this, or speculated or, or thought about. Grace Kellogg, um, in his book, The Bible Today, claims that um, a sulfur-bottomed whale would have the capacity to swallow a man whole. With a, with a jaw sort of 10 to 12 foot wide, it could swallow someone um, and hold him in its belly. A couple of hundred years ago, there was a, a story of a Mediterranean white shark which was found to have swallowed a whole sea cow, which is as big as an ox. And there's another story I came across, which is from about 100 years ago, 1926, some English sailors were, were um, in the channel harpooning whales, uh, harpooning sharks, sorry, and one of the sailors fell overboard and was swallowed by a giant uh, rhinodon. 48 hours, the shark was identified and killed, and when they opened it up, they were shocked to find inside their friend, alive but unconscious. And when they took him to hospital, he was found to be healthy, um, although his complexion, his body, his, he'd lost basically all of his hair, and his skin was a yellow-brown colour. Think of all the acids and everything inside the, 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 the creature. Now look, there's, there's a, there's a, there are other stories, other reports as well, and some scientists would refute these claims and say, is it really possible? These, are the, are these stories genuine of humans surviving. But here's the thing, right? When we come to this story for ourselves, the Almighty God could easily, easily make and control an animal, a creature, a sea creature, to swallow a man whole, to keep him in his stomach for three days for his purpose, to teach him and to, to demonstrate something to us about his capacity to bring about something amazing. It doesn't matter whether we can comprehend it or work it out scientifically with our own minds or not. Maybe we can, maybe we can't, but God can do it. When you consider some of the other miracles in Scripture, we sang last week, weren't we? If you take out every miracle in the Bible, you'd have shreds left. But think about some of the other miracles that we come across. Um, how on earth did Daniel survive a pit of very hungry lions and walk out unharmed? How could his friends escape a fiery furnace? And you, you think as well what happened in the stories after that. 
people were thrown into both of these pits and were killed instantly. Just as nature or science would predict, those people died, and yet God preserved his people. And that's what he does. God is in control of all things. The things we can understand and work out, the things we can't, he is sovereign. Isn't it amazing what God can do? So when we come back to this story and think, well, hold on, if God did this, why did he do it? Why did God have to send a massive storm and have a fish or a sea creature open its mouth and swallow Jonah and keep him in his stomach for three days? Why couldn't God just have reached down from heaven? He could just as easily have done this with a big hand, picked Jonah up, placed him right back where he started and said, hey, mate, that just shows you what I can do. Now get on with the job. Why did God do it this way? Well, Charles Spurgeon said this, and I think many of us can probably identify with this. He said, most of the grand truths of God have to be learned by trouble. They must be burned into us with the hot iron of affliction. Otherwise, we shall not truly receive them. Spurgeon goes on to say this. We discover many secrets in the caverns of the ocean, which though we had soared to heaven, we could never have known. Has that been true for you in your life? Even just talking with people this week and today about the hard things, the, the times where we've been in the depths and even that psalm that David wrote, Psalm 139, we said, we acknowledged, didn't we, as David did, that if we go up to the heavens, God's there. If we're down in the depths, he's there. But it's often in the depths where it's God that meets us and teaches us the things we could never have learned otherwise. So Jonah, as he was in this fish, he was alone. Jonah had run out of resources. He could not do anything else. Jonah had plenty of time. <laughs> Didn't have any options, did he, really? But that was the point. God's purpose was precisely that because Jonah had nothing left, it increased his opportunity to seek God and to turn back to him. And that's the question really for us, which is, what do you do when you can't do anything? What happens when you cannot change your circumstances? What happens when people have turned their backs on you and you feel abandoned? What happens when, you're, when your health fails you and you cannot make yourself well? What, what do we do when we've run out of resources? You see, when our options are limited, it actually increases our chances and our opportunity to turn to the God who we need, but we don't often realize it. And here's an interesting twist for us as we think about Jonah's situation but try and relate it to ours. Is, and you're, you're going to laugh, but it's, it's absolutely true. What would, what would have been different in Jonah's case if he'd had a smartphone? What, what would have happened in his circumstances which would not have resulted in what really happened if he'd had options. Now, look, you're already racing, aren't you? Because you're, you're, you're going to say, to, you wouldn't have had signal down there. But look, forget that, right? Forget all of the technicals, yeah? What would he have done? Could have messaged for help. Well, again, that's him trying to sort it out his own problems. He could easily have been very distracted by entertainment. Because you don't want to face it. You could be in the darkest trouble, but you don't want to face it. You're hiding still. You, you want to just, just bury all the problems that are there because there's plenty of distractions in the world, aren't there? You know, we, we go mad when the internet's down, don't we? Go mad. How are we going to survive? Jonah had three days with nothing. What do we do? Because it's rare for us to be alone because often we choose not to be alone, whether that's virtually, you know, because we're always connecting. But have we got the ability to use the opportunity that God gives us? Because sometimes 
he actually wants us to grasp the opportunity for a really, really important purpose. So when we're in the depths and when we've faced the storm and when we're in the belly of the fish, we could easily waste that for something that won't solve it. And can you see that God was providing the means? Do you remember? This is a provision story. God was providing the means. And he provides opportunities for us. He provides the means. They're not nice. They're not comfortable. They're not welcomed except for the fact that God wants us to come to him. So isn't he gracious even in that? He provides the means. The life-changing moments for us to draw back to him. But this is where the story then moves on because as God had provided Jonah the means and us the means, God hears our cries and he answers our prayers. Because it was at this moment that Jonah did the thing that we all need to do, which is inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. This is a testimony that God was Jonah's God. You see, chapter 1 Jonah had told the sailors that he was a Hebrew and that he worshipped the Lord. He admitted that the storm was his fault because he knew that God was bringing this upon them because of his failure. And even the pagan sailors prayed to the Lord before Jonah. Didn't they? They turned to him in chapter 1. But it wasn't until this moment that Jonah finally was ready to cry out to the Lord. And in reading Jonah's prayer, we're struck, I'm struck by how much it sounds and feels like you're in the Psalms. Did you pick that up? Did it feel like that to you? Sometimes we can forget, actually, that the characters in the Bible actually had access to to Scripture, the Scripture that was available or written up until that point. And so Jonah himself, prophet, lived uh, maybe 800 years before Jesus. Jesus would certainly have had the Psalms. Many of the Psalms, we know, written by King David um, a couple of hundred years earlier than, than Jonah. Other Psalms as well, of course. But it seems like Jonah here is memorized. He's memorized. He'd, he'd uh, sort of placed in his, in his mind and his heart many of the Psalms, and he was praying them as his own desperate prayers. He was appropriating them for himself and his situation. I've listed some here. We're going to see them now as we go through, the, through his prayer. We see that even in verse one, uh, verse 2, as he cries out, In my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. It, it mir- mirrors almost exactly the words at the beginning of Psalm 120. And the rest of verse 2, as he calls out from the deep of the dead, so he feels like, I mean, literally, he could have died, and he knows that. There's a spiritual thing as well. He cries out. There's, it's reminiscent of David in Psalm 18. David, who's running from Saul and needs God's help to rescue him from, from Saul's um, pursual of him. David calls out from the face of death as well. And as Jonah says... He recognizes that God hurled him into the depths. The heart of the seas and the the waves and the currents swirled around him. The waves and the breakers swept over him, he says. We're reminded, actually, of some psalms written by the sons of Korah. We did did a little series in the psalms about three years ago, didn't we? And uh, uh, the sons of Korah wrote some very dark psalms, uh, real despairing psalms. But remember in Psalm 42, where they're... The, the, the song, the prayer, uh, calls out to God in despair. And there's that talking to ourselves, that, 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 that uh, reminder that we are to tell ourselves, to turn back to God, and to put our hope in God, even when it feels like we're being crushed in the depths. Jonah recognizes, he feels feels far away from God. The the reality, of course, is that God is everywhere and God meets him there, but he feels banished from God's sight because of his own turning away. But he says, I will look again towards your holy temple. 
Again, reminiscent of some of the Psalms there. Jonah knows the water and threatens his life, but he says, and he, he acknowledges God in his prayer, he says, you have brought my life up from the pit. He knows even at that point when he's praying that he's not out of it yet, but he's praying as if he is. And some of the Psalms and some of our prayers can be true, can't they, in that we're in the midst of it, but we are uh, confident in our victory over those things because we're confident in the God who has the victory over all things. David in the Psalms, as he prays, and we'll come in a minute to Jesus, (laughs) he prays and says, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. He's confident in God's victory over death itself. And Jonah is reflecting that in his prayer. Jonah, who has not turned to God so far, he kept running until he was at the very bottom, nowhere to go. Praise, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. My prayer rose to your holy temple. God was listening from his temple. It's that symbolism of where God dwells, but of course God is everywhere. And Jonah acknowledges that clinging to idols, clinging to anything, an idol is anything that takes God's place, anything we worship or give value to that's gr- in a greater sense than God himself, is worthless. It's a worthless thing to do. And Jonah realizes that now. Whatever he was trying to do had no, no value because we're turning away from God's love. But Jonah says with shouts of grateful praise, I will sacrifice, I will make vows to you, God. Why? Because I recognize salvation is from the Lord. You know, he was helpless, he was hopeless, he had nowhere to go. The only one that could save him now was God himself. And David prayed the same in Psalm 3. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah was taking, literally owning some of the the descriptive language in the Psalms Jonah was facing a literal physical death, but he was fearing a spiritual death. What's worse? Being cut off from God forever. Surely is the worst thing that could ever happen to anyone. But he was turning back and crying out to God for forgiveness and salvation. Nothing else mattered more to Jonah. And for us, There are certain points in our lives where suddenly nothing matters more than God. Because nothing can save us or help us from a situation than Him. Jesus prayed these psalms and fulfilled these psalms in the ultimate way. When we remember that Jesus went to the, the cross. He, he went to the darkest depths. He could pray those psalms and know precisely what the darkest, darkest depths were in facing the sin of the world and suffering and bearing the weight of sin upon his shoulders for us, knowing the wrath of God. But Jesus knew that he would not be abandoned I mean, it's hard, it's, 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 we can't ever really get our heads around it, can we? Because sometimes we think on one side, we think, well, Jesus was God, and so he knew that victory was his, and, and so what's the problem? And yet Jesus was facing and went through the experience of facing God's wrath and, and humanly went through everything and worse than, than, than we could ever imagine. You know, how can we ever really get our heads around those two things? But it's true. And Jesus could still pray, I know that I'm not going to be abandoned to death. and My body will not see decay. Salvation is from the Lord. Jesus knew that he would rise again to eternal life. So the Psalms, they, they, they convey the rawness of life, don't they? The, the depths of our experience. Jesus could pray it. We can pray it too. And I think this, this prayer from Jonah really emphasizes to us, when we are in Christ... If you know Jesus, I mean, the Psalms themselves, I think, are actually pointing us and and helping us to come to Jesus, to pray those prayers that Jesus prayed so that we can experience the victory that he experienced. 
not outside of him. It's, it's because of him. But if you're a believer, if you trust in Christ, then you can pray these prayers and you can make them your own knowing that Jesus will be faithful to you in them and you can turn to God through praying them. I spent uh, quite a while actually in my own personal times praying through every psalm a couple of years ago. All of them. And it's such a, such a, 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 such a helpful thing to be able to pray all the emotions through the psalms. Psalms of praise. Psalms of despair. But realizing that God's in everything. God's with us in everything. He's been with me in everything. And so we see that God hears our cries. He listens to our prayers. He answers them. He answered Jonah. And what did he do at the end of chapter 2? Well, he did for him what he does for us. God saves us and grants us new life in Christ. See verse 10. The Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. <laughs> Descriptive language, isn't it? Sicked him up. But here it shows, doesn't it? God is the hero of the story. It shows God's purpose and his ability to provide salvation. God holds the keys to death and to life. He holds our lives in his hands. Jonah went through this physical experience and the spiritual experience to imprint a powerful truth, imprint a powerful, powerful truth on us all. Because as Jonah ran from his sin, some of the language in, 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 these, uh, chap, in these verses really, really paint the picture of us. Jonah was running. He went down to Joppa, it says. He went down. But then from the boat in the storm, he went down into the sea to the depths. Can you see Jonah went down, down, down to the bottom, to the realm of the dead. It's a picture of Jesus Christ who came from heaven, from his glory in heaven, Jesus came down for us, down to earth, gave up his splendor and his rights and his prestige and his privilege, came down to earth for us, humbled himself. And Jesus went to the cross. He went down from the cross into the grave. Jesus descended to the depths. The, the, one of the creeds tells us that he descended into hell for us. He suffered that for you but that Jesus was restored to life. He had the power to overcome death and rose from the grave to eternal life, never to be subject to death again. And this story is an image of that. As we see Jonah spat out by the fish, he was granted new life, propelled back to life again. It's a picture of Christ rising from the dead. Jonah was given a fresh start by God, by his grace. We are too. And we say again that we can turn to Jesus. Anyone can turn to Jesus who recognizes sin and the sin that cuts us away from God's love, but God is good. And God through Christ can save us through faith in him. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be reminded of today? In the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we have turned to Jesus, we are those who have died to sin. What we've done is we've given God all of those things that, that destroy us and cut us off from him, the things that lead to death. Those things are the things that Jesus has died for. And so we have put those things to death. And just as Jesus has been raised from the dead, it says that as he was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If you've turned to Jesus, you have a new life in him. I don't want to ask you this question today as we stand in gratefulness. What are your hopes for your new life in Christ? What are your hopes in terms of moving forward, of growing in this new life? And I know that many of us are suffering in different ways at the moment, physically, mentally, socially, all sorts of things. But it doesn't change, doesn't change a thing in terms of the new life that Jesus has for you now 
and the life that he's secured for you forever because it will only get better for you. So what are your hopes? What are you, what are you longing for? What, are you, what would you love to grow in Christ in at the moment? Where are you going? And how does your gratefulness that God has given you this new life, how's that going to play out in your life from now on? Now, before I finish, I left on a cliffhanger earlier, almost literally a cliffhanger. What happened in my story, or our story in our skiing trip? We were in a hopeless situation, and we were stranded with no way out. But what happened? A skiing instructor with both the knowledge of the roads and also a 4 by 4 with plenty of room for all of us in the back, granted us safe passage. We all jumped in, abandoned the minibus, and managed to get access to the roads, and we were safe. We were saved, why? Because of the kindness and the ability of someone with greater resources. And that's why I'm standing here and with she sat here to tell the tale. But here's the great thing, eh? If Jesus has saved you, you're here to tell the tale. Got new life. How are you going to make the most of it from this day forwards? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that life and death are literally in your hands. You, you hold the keys. We thank you that in our story today, you provided the means for Jonah to turn to you. Thank you that you provide everything that we need in order to draw us closer. And Father, sometimes that is through pain and difficulty. And we don't welcome it, and we don't enjoy that. But we thank you that you're merciful in that you've provided yourself. Thank you that you've provided your son for us to draw close to you. Father, there, there may be some repenting in our lives at the moment, and I pray that we would seriously bring those things before you, that we need to ask for your forgiveness for. Lord, we, we pray for others who, who need our prayers right now. We pray for those who are lost, who need to turn to Christ, maybe people that need to turn back to Jesus that we're deeply concerned for. We, we pray for them. And we thank you, Lord, that in the depths you meet us there. Thank you that through Christ you bring us up, up, and the new life you've given us is something that we can never repay you for. You don't want payment. You just want our worship. And so, Lord, we give you our thankfulness, our praise, and we give you our lives back. Lord, help us to enjoy the new life you've given us. Help us to learn what it is to follow Jesus day by day. And so we praise you and thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace to us. In Jesus' name. Amen.